Hello and welcome to another episode of Rewild My Bio. I'm your host, Sean Slade, and joined with me for this very special episode is the wild and wonderful Wade Lightheart. Wade's a three-time Canadian national, all-natural bodybuilding champion who has competed as a vegetarian as well as in the Mr. Universe competition. He's the host of the Awesome Health Podcast, and Wade is one of the world's premier authorities on all things natural nutrition and fitness training, which I guess is to be expected after 25 years in the industry, coaching thousands of clients and, you know, being a highly sought after high performance coach. So anyways, specific to our conversation today about digestion, he is the co-founder and president of a company called Bio Optimizers and which essentially is a supplementation company focusing in digestive health and just overall optimization. So stay tuned in just a minute. I'm going to share the affiliate link that we have set up for you guys. And also, before I forget, in regards to the cool things for you guys that Wade and everyone at BioOptimizers has given to the listeners here of the podcast so generously, and that is the biological optimization blueprint that Wade and his team made up. And honestly, in these times when we're chatting about sometimes how it seems like modern lifestyles and everything that's going on in the world right now, it's kind of stacked against us or stacked against our biology. Um, We are meant to thrive and Wade's outlook on life with a positive mental attitude and everything he kind of broke down that's in this biological optimization blueprint sounds like something that I could get behind personally. And I want to really just hype that up and extend that over to you guys or, you know, let you know about it because it is actually made free as well. So again, head over to biooptimizers.com and I'll share more about the affiliate stuff in just a minute. So it was a great opportunity to have Wade in to discuss all things digestion. Specifically, we dive deep into the gut brain connection. And honestly, he truly is a wealth of knowledge. And it was great to pick his brain and kind of put, you know, that nature connection rewilding lens on as we discuss, you know, this very important topic, because I do believe that there is a, you know, a problem afoot. Modern lifestyle leads to all sorts of dysfunction and disease in many different ways. And one way I believe is how that how modernity impacts our mental health, as well as how that impacts our digestive system. So we've chatted about on the show before we've chatted about the link between uh, soil health and gut health or your microbiome. And so I think this episode, again, there's so many different ways we can look at digestion when looking at reconnecting with our true nature and, you know, doing things that we're supposed to be doing, things that we evolved with, you know, like eating real food and things like that. So it was great to have such a great authority figure like Wade here chatting about this and honestly sharing his, you know, what he does to tap into his wild side. So Wade's a Canadian. I'm a Canadian. It's great to chat to someone who's living out there in Venice Beach, California and has you know, that landscape of sunsets and the opportunity to do some earthing there and that sand, you know, year round, I'm, I'm kind of jealous, to tell you the truth, Wade, but no, honestly, it was great to connect and just kind of share our stories and get to know Wade as, um, you know, we've crossed paths or at least, you know, frequented different fitness conferences in Toronto at say the CanFit Pro conference and things like that. So honestly, it was great to get to know him. And another thing I'm really excited about is the fact that I have become this podcast has become part of the affiliate program with bio optimizers, which honestly is really exciting for me because, well, essentially listeners of the podcast, you guys are going to get 10% off your order and every order. If you head over to biooptimizers.com and you use the code rewild my bio. So that is going to be an enduring, uh, affiliate partnership that I have going for the remainder of the podcast. So I'm really excited to bring that one to you guys and working on bringing some other affiliate uh, links and, and whatnot, some discounts to you guys. So stay tuned for more exciting stuff on the go. I hope to have everything up on the website very soon. So you'll be able to head to a shop tab and you'll be able to see affiliate links and discount codes from different guests and resources and things that we chat about on the show. So again, very humbled and grateful to be a part of that team and, um, you know, to try out more of these products from these guys. I've used things like Gluten Guardian in the past. And again, looking at some of the other, uh, you know, podcasters, bloggers, health professionals that support and, uh, you know, are on this affiliate program. I have, uh, you know, these people have a lot of integrity or I look at them as having a lot of integrity. So I feel like I'm just really, really, again, grateful to be there. So please, uh, you know, it does me a favor. It'll do you a favor. You'll save 10%. But yeah, head over again, biooptimizers.com, and you can use the code rewildmybio. 
Now that said, I think I've kind of covered everything here in regards to, um, you know, this topic. Uh, we, we chat about the gut brain connection. Wade goes over in some great detail the stages of digestion, as well as what he feels is the number one thing you can do to help heal your digestive system if you're having problems. And honestly, it's, it's a huge problem. Uh, I think it's like the second, uh, you know, it's, well, Wade gives some, some stats here today as to how big of a problem this is. And I know that it really does affect people's mental health and their overall sense of well-being. Um, so yeah, without any further ado, I want to dive right into this today. Um, again, thanks so much for everybody for leaving comments and feedback as of late. Um, you know, here in Canada anyways, lockdown measures are getting stricter and stricter and, you know, it's kind they've kind of proven themselves to not be effective because we're here, we are a year later and it was supposed to be two weeks to flatten the curve and we're still under these lockdown orders. So frustrations are high. Um, but I think what's, you know, kind of see the silver lining here in all this I feel like because um what I'm what I really truly do feel is that this is kind of like the last straw here and I think so many people are waking up to this so I've kind of you know I said I was going to remain silent on all things social media posting about you know whatever it is in and around coronavirus or um, you know, what's considered uh, misinformation or conspiracy theories. Um, but when there's actual data starting to be, you know, of like, say, hospital room busyness being put out by members of parliament and uh, other people like police officers, you know, speaking up and actually saying we won't enforce these, um, you know, stay at home, new stay at home orders like that, that says a lot. So it's, it's a, you know, it's a crazy time, but I think we're, I think we're turning a corner here. And I hope that as the weather, you know, gets nice, people actually start just heading outdoors and uh, getting in touch with nature, planting their gardens, and all those things that are super important. So again, um, kind of segued off on a random tangent there, but I am, uh, I'm thinking of all you out there, the silent majority that I know is just doing what, you know, just staying quiet. Um, but I think tides are turning and I'm happy to say that um, freedom is on its way. So without any further ado, enjoy the episode. Welcome to Rewild My Bio, a self-help and alternative health podcast. I'm your host, Sean Slade. Join me as I share stories, science, and strategies to help you rewild your biology and redefine your biography. I'm joined here with Wade Lightheart of BioOptimizers and the Awesome Health Health Podcast. Wade, thanks so much for being here. So great to be here. Thanks, man. Awesome. Well, it's great to be talking to a fellow Canadian who's out in California. So I'm kind of living vicariously through, I'm sure, the sandy beaches and sunsets you get to see out there. Took me a long time to get here and it was worth it. It was. Uh, I believe <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, it was. <laughs> well, you know, sunshine aside, we're going to actually dive into the weeds on, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, uh, a very important topic, digestive troubles specifically. And I mean, it's, it's the second cause of people missing work next to the, you know, the common cold or what we now call coronavirus. I'm just kidding. Um, no, <laughs> but I really do think that in this day and age, things like gluten sensitivity, IBS, IBD, um, you know, they're such a big problem in modern society and they kind of, as I see it anyway, stem from the stressors of modernity. And I really do think they're linked to a lot of mental health conditions and vice versa with the gut. So I really want to dive into all things, you know, gut brain connection here with you today. Um, but I guess before we do that, tell folks exactly your journey into health and fitness. Um, you're a well-known man throughout the, the space. Your podcast have had many great guests on. So yeah, tell folks exactly a little bit about you and what got you to starting bio optimizers? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I was a Canadian growing up in born in Ontario, grew up on the East Coast, uh, which is up by Maine for American listeners. And uh, life was pretty normal playing hockey and baseball in the summer and all that sort of stuff. And then when I was 15, my whole life changed. Um, my sister, who was 
my first off, my parents moved to a very rural area. It was literally five miles up a dirt road uh, into where the telephone poles end. It was we were the caretakers of a private resort. Mm -hmm. So it was a beautiful place in the middle of the woods. But I certainly didn't want to be there when I was 15. Right. Simultaneously, my sister was diagnosed with um, a form of Hodgkin's disease. And that um, disease is a cancer of the lymph nodes. And I watched her go through the medical model before she died at the age of 22. She was four years my senior. She died my first year of university. So that was um, very impactful in the essence that, number one, I recognize that your life isn't a guarantee and your health isn't a guarantee. And so at a formative age, it made me ask the questions, well, what is health and how do you get it? And, and although I didn't have a very good definition, um, it set me in a certain direction. I think that a lot of people don't have at that age. And then the third thing, around the same time, when I was 15, my sister gave me a, a magazine. It was a muscle and fitness magazine that had Troy Zuccolato, Mr. California on the cover. Two pretty girls. And, I, and he had all these muscles and everything. And, he just, and I was like, wow, maybe if I get some muscles, I'll be able to get some girls. So I said, so I went and, uh, you know, driven mad with testosterone. I built a gym. Isn't that how anybody gets into fitness though? Right. Like, right? Aesthetics is usually the first it, call. It's so true. Yeah. Um, it's a big aesthetics. Push and then there might be performance related to a sport, but ultimately ends up at the health at the For bottom. Sure. So we have a triangle that we look at, uh, the bioptimization triangle, those three things that you want to maximize or optimize. And it's different at different stages, but most young people, it's, it's a physical thing. And it certainly was for me now. And I built a gym in the barn, kind of like Rocky in, when he fought the Russian kind of where he's training in the gym and you know, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And, um, and that was just normal. And I, I discovered a book by Arnold Schwarzenegger called education of a bodybuilder. And of course, at that time he was the number one television star in the world. He was a former Mr. Olympia, Mr. Universe, you know, multi-time winner. And in his book, he said, uh, you can achieve anything you want in life with hard work, self-discipline, and a positive attitude. Well, in a rural environment, which was fishing, lumber, manual labor, all this, everybody worked hard. But this idea of a positive attitude and um, self-discipline, these were new concepts introduced to me. And so I applied virtually all things Arnold to my life. And, you know, began training and created a vision for myself, imagining myself living in Venice Beach, California, competing at the Mr. Universe and having a supplement company that helped people be healthier around the world. And turned out that's how it ended up in the end, but it was a long journey to get there. Mm -hmm. The one thing I would say, which is related to your topic, and we can dive into it, is looking back now... Um, in my career, which, you know, I went to university, studied exercise physiology. After university, I went on to mentor under different areas and different parts. I've worked in every aspect of the fitness industry from fitness warehouse to being a sponsored athlete to opening, uh, to working in nutrition stores, managing a gym, and then eventually opening my own juice bar, developing a personal training business. And while I was competing, and in 2003, I got to represent our country, Canada, at the Mr. Universe contest. I won a couple of national championships. and and uh, But after that, I gained 42 pounds of fat and water after the Mr. Universe contest in 11 weeks. I went from Mr. Universe to Mr. Marshmallow. Mm -hmm. And it was devastating. I thought, oh, my God, I spent 16 years of my life working towards this. I got the best coach in the world. I got total discipline. I got a positive attitude. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. What happened? And the, the, the little breadcrumb on the trail was I met a guy by the name of Dr. Michael O'Brien, who was the picture of health and vitality. He was in his 70s. He had clear skin. His eyes would look through. He had all this energy. He was so knowledgeable. And he gave these lectures to health and nutritionist professionals about how to heal the body. And I went up to him after and I said, Dr. O'Brien, what, what, what I don't know here. I mean, I've, I've got all the credentials, all the background. I've done all the work, got all the code. What's, what's going on? And he says, wait, you learn to build the body from the outside in. I'm going to teach you to build the body from the inside out. Mm -hmm. And so he taught me about enzymes and probiotics and hydrochloric acid and mineralization and chemicalization and its impact on the body and all this stuff. And so I had followed a performance-based diet. Mm -hmm relative to aesthetics for my bodybuilding career, but now I was going to find a health 
based diet. And so I followed him. I took a whole pile of supplements. I went to a raw food diet. Six months later, I recaptured my physique and my health. Simultaneously, my business partner and I, uh, Matt Gallant, uh, started selling online courses because I wanted to help. My mission was to help people avoid the same mistakes that I made because I could see this is where all athletes were going to head. Uh, once I understood the parameters and uh, we started selling courses and over the next four years, I coached 15,000 people online. That was back in the days of boards and all that stuff. There was no right. Facebook and social media. A and true pioneer for sure. We got a lot of clinical data mm -hmm. at that point and I applied it all and went back in very short time prepared for the two and won two more national titles and went back to the worlds again. Uh, was bigger, stronger, um, placed instead of 13th, I placed fifth, which was way better. And, and I really have no business being a bodybuilder. I don't have the genetics for it, but I just had the mm -hmm. desire. Mm -hmm. Um, and after that contest, I didn't have the weight gain. I didn't blow up. I didn't feel bad. Like everybody does dieting. I, I, I had overcome all the negative sides of that kind of lifestyle. And at that point I was like, okay, we've got something here. And I took it to the world. I had a little holistic health clinic and then um, about, um, five or it was, we, we did that for five, six years and had an awesome lifestyle living around the world. And then we decided that we would, uh, rebrand the company as by optimizer. So we, we really actually been in existence. We were mass I'm Zinc before, uh, we have been in business doing our thing since 2004 mm. and we started fixing digestion and then we moved into the nervous system and then now we're into brain optimization because we kind of go through the channels but the, right. to echo your point that you talked about earlier right now 13 percent of the emergency hospital visits are related to gastrointestinal issues um, in the United States, 100 million people are suffering from digestive distress on any given day, mm -hmm. and 25% of those are on permanent prescription medication, most, most which are designed to be used for four to six weeks. Right. Yeah. This is a very big problem, and it's expanding. And the reason this is happening is because of what started to transpire about 80 years ago. And that's it's hard for people to understand the history and impact. So uh, we can go in a lot of different places. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I'd like to maybe even continue on that, but let's maybe talk about the stages of digestion and before we kind of maybe go back into that whole gut brain connection, because I mean, at 2004 to start working in di even the digest di digestive space, creating supplements for that's a little bit ahead of the time. I recall in, I think it was 2014, that was the most Googled health word. Fermented foods were the most Googled health word in 2014. And that was right in around the time that I had started that kombucha company. So, um, and even that was still, you know, it was on the tip of a lot of people's tongues then, right? So, and then again, to add the, uh, you know, the nootropics and the, and the brain uh, optimization aspect to it, again, with this more recent research, I guess in the last 10 years, it just makes sense to be, to be covering it on all angles there. So yeah, let's maybe cover what, what the stages of digestion are. Uh, we don't have to shy away from talking about poop, um, which, you know, I know that's one stage of it. And I think it's an important part of that at, towards the end yeah. of it. Right. But uh, yeah, what uh, what exactly are the stages of digestion? How does a, a healthy digestive system work? Yeah, for for layman, I have broken it down into five distinct stages. You could break it down into an infinite mm -hmm. number of movements, mm -hmm. but let's we'll get the generalizations. Um, so the first stage is to move yourself into the anticipation in um digestive response mechanism. So taste, touch, feel, smell, and chew your food, which creates a, an environment where your body is prepared to eat. You need to move from fight or flight into rest and relax. Mm -hmm. That's typically how things work. Right. Unfortunately, for the most part, we eat in a, in a state of overstimulation. We're watching televisions, we're on blue lights, we're texting our phone, we're strung out on caffeine or in traffic, gobbling down food or standing in front of a movie screen, right. sitting in front of a movie screen. All these sort of things are not our natural state to be in recovery and resting where our digestion works optimally. Um, where the idea is that we taste, smell. So for, for example, if I say dill pickles and sauerkraut, a lot of people will start to salivate already. There's mm. a Pavlovian response just to even the mere thought of certain things. And that's an interesting response to say, well, why is the body doing that? Because it is actually preparing for the consumption of these things. And we can actually make psychological cues. And of course, that's a big part of advertising. You associate 
psychology with emotions and create response mechanisms that make you run to the 7-Eleven at midnight to get a bunch of ice cream and you don't know why because <laughs> yeah. you've been hypnotized. Um, so that's the first stage. And then after you chew the food up, the food will then travel down the esophagus into the stomach and the stomach's divided up into two sections. And the top section is called the upper cardiac portion of the stomach. Now, what's interesting about that is that is where the enzymes present in the food are going to start breaking down the food. And you have about 30 to 60 minutes before hydrochloric acid comes in. Now, there's a challenge with that because humans are the only species on the planet that eats cooked food. Right. So now I'm not to say that there isn't advantages to cooked food. It certainly solved a lot of calorie issues, storage issues, transport issues. Mm -hmm. But conversely, our, our, cooking and our pasteurization processes that we use in the modern world has eliminated all the enzymes and probiotics that are naturally present in the food. So I always like to say like tigers, when they take down a zebra, they, they eat the intestines first where the enzymes and probiotics are, and then they consume the tissue. And the tissue in a live state has enzymes. Same thing as um, a horse or a cow, if they're eating grass, they try and find the sprouts where the, the freshest Grass is where it gets the most enzymatic capability to help and aid in the digestive process. Bears will eat, you know, the salmon that's jumping out of the river, right? Because it's the most lively, rich enzyme, and it eats the right. selects its berries on the, the most enzymatically dependent, uh, ripe. Mm -hmm. So, this is a natural inclination of all species on the planet, but we've changed that, and largely apart in our food chain, we also accelerate. Um, you know, there's some evidence that color vision was developed to determine how ripe fruits were, um, which we, when we lived in the trees and, and, and our ability to pick up the movement of snakes, which right. were uh, often detrimental to human life <laughs> or pre-human life. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, these mechanisms that we just kind of take for granted were actually the things of recognizing food. But today we use gas um, to ripen foods that are, you know, picked prematurely. We'll also use uh, coloring agents, uh, you know, waxing agents, a variety of different chemicals to make food look like it's ripe, but actually right. it's not uh, fully rich. So after that 30 to 60 minutes, when hydrochloric acid comes in, um, that's the third stage. And hydrochloric acid has two distinct features. What it does first is it disinfects our food, that kills out the viruses, the bacteria, the pathogenic worms or parasites or um, bugs that may be in with the food. So it, virtually any pathogen, high levels of hydrochloric acid will wipe that out. The second thing that hydrochloric acid does is it changes the pH of this food chime, which activates some enzymes and deactivates others. Okay, depending on the pH. So as it as the pH drops, as the mixture mixes, then then that will activate or deactivate various enzymatic components. Once the stomach, uh, the food is leaves the stomach, there's a, it's mixed with what's called bicarbonate buffers, which is a fancy name for alkaline minerals, mm -hmm. and that neutralizes the the stomach acid so that the food won't burn holes in the intestinal tract. And by the way, if you don't have enough hydrochloric acid, what will happen, there's a little sphincter on top of the esophagus mm -hmm. that will stay open either from gas discharge or will not close because there was enough hydrochloric acid. Mm -hmm. Your food starts because of food fermenting in your stomach. And then some of that acid will splash up on the esophagus mm -hmm. and um, people will get heartburn or acid reflux. Mm -hmm. And what happens is they get, they said, oh, well, you're, you're, you need an antacid pill. Well, actually, what the nine times out of ten, the real issue is, is that you had not enough hydrochloric acid, and so I find that interesting. That you know, right. our treatment is actually worse, yeah. and now we open ourselves up to all sorts of bacteria infections or right. or these critters coming into our body. So once once it's left and it's been buffered with the alkaline minerals, it goes into the fourth stage of digestion. As it is in the intestinal tract, the food will be interacted by bacteria. Now, in our stomach, we have hundreds of strains of bacteria, 10% good, 10% bad, and 80% of them are opportunists. Mm -hmm. In other words, they are going to either grow or shrink based on the dietary choices of that individual. 
Now there are genetic and epigenetical components to this. Um, and then there's environmental components, whether that is chemicals and pesticides, which interrupt those things that you're consuming, whether it's been uh, an, an overuse of antibiotics, which are indiscriminate between good guys or bad guys, and uh, a variety of different chemical agents and things that will interact with this medium. And there's like a mucoid layer in your intestinal tract where various strains will live at different levels. And they kind of go into a semi-dormant stage on one dairy dietary. And then when they eat some other things, they come active. And we'll see this right. when people get food poisoning, when they travel and things like that, because they're exposed to different bugs or different types of diets that may cause a reaction inside the body. Right. Um, the final stage is elimination. And in that elimination stage, this is where, um, you know, peristaltic contraction moves through the whole body. But that final space is this contraction of the smooth tissue to remove the waste from the body. Now, that can be interrupted by um, dehydration, um, impingements on the nervous system that activates smooth muscle through the spinal column because uh, we sit too much and we're very inactive and sometimes that puts pressure on these components. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, we're all trying to address all of those issues simultaneously. And so ideally you want to have a, a digestion that you have the optimal transit time, a dietary pro uh, food combination that allows you to digest, absorb and utilize the food mm -hmm. and eliminate uh, any undigested food because any food that is undigested uh, now serves as a potential toxin by feeding the bad bacteria who literally will poop negative chemicals into our bloodstream. So if you're waking up with, uh, if you're eating meals and you're feeling gassy and bloated after, or you find that you wake up with brain fog and crusty eyes and, you know, uh, you need a giant coffee to wake yourself up, right. there's good indication that you have undigested proteins uh, leaching through what's called leaky gut. And Harvard just said that pretty much everybody has some amount of leaky gut in them. And these things cause an inflammatory response because your immune system sees it as an invader and attacks it and causes inflammation. Right. And so, uh, and then also constipation and, and um, diarrhea are usually combinations of this different version variants of the same issue, which is an impacted colon where it's either really, really restrictive or there is some sort of disruption in this microbiome that's not allowing you and it's flushing out the food because your body can't absorb and utilize it. So that's the five stages. There's the five stages. Well, I'm going to recap those for everybody listening. That was really, really thorough, I would say, in my opinion. Um, and of course, you added the, the elimination, the poop, like I asked. So that's, <laughs> but no, to start with the, the preparation. So we have to get in that mindset. We have to slow down, chew our food. And that mindset going into uh, even thinking about food is an important first stage. From there, it goes into the stomach, at which point we're seeing things like enzymes and probiotics or enzymes rather breaking things down and then the acid coming in and then lowering the pH so that it's more usable for the next stage as it goes in through the alkalizing phase. Is that the third stage there then? And then after, uh, yeah. is, that, is that it? Essentially? Third, between third and fourth, third and fourth is what, where it comes out. When it's coming out of the stomach, it's alkalized. It's alkalized there. And, you, and that's where you had mentioned the Tums piece. And are you familiar with the uh, lemon juice test to kind of see if you are high or low in? So I'll, I'll yeah. leave that in the show notes, but I guess... You can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's essentially taking like a tablespoon of lemon juice in and around that time where you might feel like you've kind of got that heartburn thing going on. Maybe right before a meal, you would take the lemon juice. And if the lemon juice, the acid essentially in the lemon juice, if that takes away that kind of heartburny feeling, then it's, that's a sign that you don't have enough uh, acid in your stomach. Is that correct? Yeah. That's basically yeah, how it goes. There's yeah. either a deficiency in enzymes or a deficiency of hydrochloric right. acid and oftentimes it's a combination of the two. I see. No, and I, and it's worth saying because I, I feel like, like you, like you pointed out our treatment, the common treatment in, you know, modern day is to suppress something where you actually need more of that acid. So anyways, after that, we get into the stage that I find really interesting and that's the feeding of the bacteria in our guts because they need food too. And then from there, the elimination, right? So, um, no, that's great. And I think, um, it's important maybe to, dive back into the enzyme probiotic piece a little bit because um, I feel like our hunter-gatherer ancestors, um, we, we've learned a lot, I guess, in the last 20 years, or at least I know I've learned a lot in looking at how our ancestors actually uh, interacted in the world. So there was, you know, rich biodiversity. They were interacting um, with different microbes in the soil and whatnot. 
And we've chatted about that here on the show before, about that connection between soil, health, and then our guts. So I guess maybe in your words, why are enzymes and probiotics important in the modern day? And maybe how was it different for us back for our ancestors? Yes. Well, this is, you know, um, everything changed in 1945. What happened is the United States dropped a nuclear bomb on Japan, ending the war and ushering in the industri- like the next wave of the industrialization of the of particularly the Western society. Uh, digital communication increased, shipping around the world increased. So people wanted, you know, pasta from Italy and orange juice from Florida and coffee from South America and cereal from the great Western plains and mm-hmm. and ship them all around and demanding and marketing and all that came and so. People moved away from growing their own food in farm and rural settings, which I think 96% of the population at the turn of the century grew their own food, into industrialized Asia, where they were responsible, where they had to get food from sources. Yeah. Um, there was also a population exposure. So the governments of the world concerned about being able to feed this growing population started to create uh, agricultural boards to determine stabilized foods, and they went into monoculture farming and factory farming, essentially. And what happens is we stopped crop rotation. Um, they used to rotate your crops. You grow this crop one year on this line and that different on different ones on that same plot. And then you'd have a year where you grew hemp and then you would plow the hemp back into the soil to reconstitute the, um, the microbiotics, the, the flora inside the soil, soil right? Mm-hmm. These, these important organisms that are essential for the, for the plant to get the nutrients for the, the soil to break down properly. Right. And what happened is they still couldn't get enough. And, and then they said, oh, what do we do? Well, well, we can use this leftover nitrogen from the war, and now we can grow the food faster if we put nitrogen fertilizer in the soil, which mm-hmm. increases the growth times but decreased the nutrient quality of the food. And then the plant started to give up its protein to make enzymes because it didn't have enough time to do it to try and extract minerals and vitamins. And so the nutritive value of food started to diminish exponentially, and then the plants got weaker. Mm -hmm. And so then they went, okay, well, let's add herbicides, pesticides, and fungicides to fight off the pests because, you know, plants will make scents and aromas and and these things to to create the pests from eating them. And uh, turns out, (laughs) well... Then we went into genetic modification, and then and, and interesting about herbicides, pesticides, and fungicides is that they actually destroy the enzymatic activity of those pests. Right. And so, enzymes are the difference between stones, plants, and people. They're the metabolic workers of your body. They are in over twenty-five thousand different enzymatic reactions that they know of, and probably thousands of more. And when your enzymatic activity starts to diminish or stop, this is when you start having the failure of various organs or metabolic processes and eventually leads to death. Right. So, um, and you can read all about this by Food Enzyme, Food Enzymes for Health and Longevity by Dr. Howe, Edward Howe, or, or Enzyme Nutrition is the more, I would say, layman's term book. For sure. No, thanks for that. Because that, that's just it. It is the, you know, the root of, of many and all disease and downfall of, you know, the human biology without a doubt, not, not having proper enzyme action in our bodies. Yeah. And, and so then, and many of these chemical agents disrupt the microbiome. So for example, many different types of bacteria can't re- recognize genetically modified food. Um, the preservatives and dyes used in um, commercialized growing to make your colors look good or to uh, preserve the food for longer than normal periods through um, things like, you know, where they irradiate the food, which destroys the enzymes. And then we cook the food, cooking interstitial the enzymes and all these ideas to remove bacteria from our food, which were symbiotically or nor- normal, now have been eliminated in this kind of antibacterial, antiseptic type world. And there's advantages to being antibacterial and antiseptic. But we need good ones. Right. And so when I go to my mother's garden, and we used to make fun of my mother back when I was in the 80s, if you can imagine, because she wouldn't use fertilizer and she wouldn't use bug spray on her plant. She was one of the original organic gardeners Mm -hmm. uh, in our little town. And people used to tease her, but her food tasted incredible. It tasted better. It looked better. It was more vibrant, had more energy. And when I first went to university, I was eating at 
you know, uh, I was staying in a university, you know, eating at the, the, the dinner meal, I guess you could call it. And, uh, the freshman they weren't 15. having, that's the yeah, freshman they 15 having, becomes a thing. <laughs> yeah. They did. Well, I noticed that I didn't have the same energy. I didn't feel right. the same when I ate the food there. And then I'd come home, uh, for the holidays of the summer and I'd eat the food and I felt more energized in life. And I was like, what's the difference here? And that's when I started to first understand the impact of chemicalization very innocently, didn't know it. And I was like, wow, there's something to this. And that's when I got into it more and more as the, the decades went by and yeah. turned out my mom was right. And right. so that was fascinating. But the, the problem is, is we're starting from such a reduced connection to our food, to growing, to nature, to all of these components, which you're a big proponent of, yeah. is that, and we don't know anything about our history. So we can't imagine what food was like 80 years ago. Right when a tomato tastes like a tomato and a carrot tastes like a carrot. And, and I would invite people to go out to a Mennonite farm mm -hmm. where they use seed passed down for 300 years, 200 years right. and eat a tomato or eat foods and vegetables that you're normally associated with or eat. Uh, if you're into animals and eating animals, like eat the animals that, that, that were grown in this environment where the eggs, right. the eggs look different. Mm -hmm. The chickens taste different. The vegetables are you're, you're like it's like a whole new food groups right. and you're like what's going on and you start to get a scope of where we actually are and i think that disconnection from our food mm. today has made it easier for people to not understand the problem because how do you right. know if you've how do you know right you know we're on the heels here as you're saying this i'm thinking about real food and you're mentioning mennonite communities here and on southwestern ontario as you may know we have a lot of amish and mennonite communities yes. and just down the way here is elmer ontario and awesome mm -hmm. amish community and just the access to real quality food is amazing but we're recording this podcast literally on the heels of news about a court case here in ontario that involved raw milk and I know you guys can get raw milk out in California. However, here in Ontario, it's something that you still have to be part of a cow share. Essentially, I own a cow, so therefore I'm able to get raw milk from my cow. However, a Supreme Court battle that's been going on at least 12 years, honestly, um, as long as I can remember or have been a part of the Weston A. Price Foundation, but um, it, they just lost. It was Michael Schmidt lost. So essentially, m my dairy farm, a lot of others in the area are basically being shut down. So again, to your point of like, microbes in the soil, and obviously, grass fed, um, healthy cows, raw dairy, super, super great. I make, you know, yogurt or kefir out of it. And it's, um, you know, just full of probiotic, and just liveliness, right? Enzymes, and, bacteria, and, and, and then now it's like, stuff. yeah, exactly. So now it's, it's, it's kind of up in the air in Ontario. So I just kind of want to bring that out as awareness, or I don't know if, if there's anybody out there listening that, you know, um, feels like they want to kind of get involved or see what is possible. But at this point, it looks like it's very bleak for raw dairy here in Ontario because the Supreme Court of Canada essentially just created a template to use any and all against any and all other farmers. Right. So, yeah. And they also ruled against knowing whether uh, giving Canadians the right to know if their food has been genetically modified or not. Mm. The, we do not know what the long-term effects could be from eating genetically modified food or what the long-term effects will be to farming itself. Right. There's also a number of court cases with genetically modified crops uh, altering other farmers. And here's the other part yeah, is, right. is companies like Monsanto are suing the farmers that they're disrupting for using their genetically modified seeds with these, these killer seeds, which go right. off and pollinate and damage um, traditional crop growing inside the country, which is, you know, people have to people have to wake up and, and recognize what's going on. To give you an idea, though, mm. um, the British monarchy under the un, under Prince Charles has the largest organic seed bank in the world. Interesting. Eh? They've stored and kept to themselves because I believe as a self defense protectionism about maybe rampant use of yeah. genetic modification in the future. Yeah, there's some interesting things going on in regards to farming and land being bought up by folks who have enough money to do lots and lots of land where it's kind of concerning. So yeah, again, uh, rewilding lifestyle, getting back, saving seeds, growing your own plants, even if it's a, you know, inner city urban garden, or you're a member of a, a, a community garden or something like that. It's just so important to get your hands in the soil, I think, these days. Um, so let's do a little segue, because really what we're talking about is, uh, you know, food quality down, digest, poor digestion, you know, uh, is rampant and then mental illness is also 
ramp it. So, I mean, let's talk about the gut brain connection. How does that work? It, it is somewhat as of an axis as I've under, or an axis yes. as I've understood it. So it kind of one affects the other and back and forth. Um, so yeah, let's maybe chat about what exactly the gut brain connection is. Cause we did a great job chatting about, uh, you know, how the digestive system could be compromised when you went over the stages. So maybe let's talk about starting with the brain side of this connection here. We live in a symbiotic relationship with these probiotics, sometimes called the microbiome, the gut flora. But probiotics are in that fourth stage of digestion where they're converting the food chime into either energy units mm -hmm. or building blocks. Now, the type of bacteria that you have, for example, they just um, pulled a, um, a tribe that had been unexposed to any human contact ever uh, and out of the Amazon. And they found that they had hundreds of more strains of bacteria that we've never seen before. So a, a diversity within their intestinal tracts that were, were, were being remarkable. And there's research going on right now to determine all these components and how much that might impact our capabilities of awareness. And why I say that is because many of the neurotransmitters that your brain works on are manufactured in your gut or are dependent on specific amino acid combinations that are uh, broken down through enzymes and transmitted into your body and then to the brain barrier. So without understanding these things, what we might be doing is cutting off a, a complete level of awareness by taking away these essential gut bacteria. Right. Conversely, if you have the wrong bacteria in, or, or what I would say is bacteria that is disruptive to your immune system. So for example, undigested proteins, there'll be different types of bacteria that'll feed off them and cause uh, production of indole, skate, all these neurochemical toxins, which will depress neurotransmitter function. So serotonin, to give you an example, about 90% of that is made in your gut. That's the kind of feel happy, connected, you know, switched on mode. Right. Um, and so many people who aren't able to produce enough serotonin because they've become, you know, dopamine burned out from, totally. from these things. The now they're feeling disconnected and not part of something and isolated in this digital world. And then their neurotransmitters depressed. And then they go into the hot, you know, the doctor and they say, well, you got neurotransmitter demand. Let's give you some antidepressants. Let's give you this. And they feel good for a while, but they never consider that, Hey, this digestive is so, uh, number one, you need to convert the right amino acids so your digestive system needs to work right. Your, di your dietary choices need to be low in inflammatory uh, proteins and chemical agents. And two, you need to have the right pro or three, you need the right probiotics in there so that you can actually break down those foods and make those neurotransmitters in a way that's going to allow you to be happy and healthy. And so sometimes people I always joke about this. It's like, you know, you're sitting there at, 11 o'clock at night, you don't have to eat and somehow you're off to the 7-Eleven or whatever to eat. Well, why is that? Well, back, the bacteria connect intimately with our central nervous system mm. and they will actually be making demands for the foods that they want, not necessarily the foods that you need. Mm -hmm. And so when people are dealing with uncontrollable cravings or uncontrollable mood dysregulation, oftentimes they can be traced into a disbalance in the microbiome. And I have countless examples of people who have cleaned up their gut and there's like, uh, all of a sudden I get up early in the morning now, I don't have trouble getting out of bed and right. uh, I, my relationships are better and I seem to be able to focus longer. Mm -hmm. And so I think many of the conditions that we're treating with pharmaceuticals to provide relief for people who are suffering um, could be even better dealt with if we we're able to get people's dietary components and their digestive capabilities better. I believe that mm -hmm. great health leads to a wider range of choices, not a diminishing range of choices, as most people tend to believe. That's so true. Because that's just it. Once that, once you stop that vicious cycle, things start to get better on the, in the opposite direction, right? So you, and I mean, just looking at throughout the life course, yes, um, you know, neurodegeneration is a thing. However, our brain, we do realize, you know, we can build it's very plastic in the sense that we can, you know, build new neurons and new connections and stuff like that. And we can always continually learn. But I find that once you kind of get into that slippery slope of say degeneration, neuro, like neuro, neurologically, or say your 
under a lot of stress. Um, I, I just find in this last year, as we've kind of been removed from each other in nature, I see the stress levels going up. So I can only imagine what that's doing to people's guts. And and like you say, like, you know, I've helped people too with digestive problems. And it's it's a real thing that weighs on you mentally. So again, it, you can see it in someone's life. If you've struggled with digestion and you don't know if you can leave the toilet or leave the, the bathroom because you're going to have to go, like the idea of running because you're going to shit your pants essentially is not a fun way to live your life and it really does um you know weighs on people's psyche so um it's just it's interesting to me anyways that well for example something like cognitive biotics biotics which we're chatting about maybe even chat about this right now because i think it's it's worth a plug because it is kind of addressing both ends of this gut brain axis well yeah it it addresses you know i'm very passionate about this a lot of friends have you know, challenges in their mental health. And I've been on a mission to solve these from a nutritional, digestive, enzymatic, probiotic component. And so how we came up with Cognibiotics, we have a university team in Europe who are PhDs in the microbiome. And we were looking at a couple of areas. Number one, how could we repair leaky gut? We created products around that. And then also, okay, we know that neurotransmitters that are being formed like serotonin, come from these specialized bacteria what would happen with if we started introducing those into people's guts with the right prebiotics and we combined it we didn't just stop there Mm. we also looked at the chinese medicine i think it was um charles poliquin the famous strength sensei coach Mm. um who who trained gold medalists in 27 different olympic sports which is incredible in the who's who of, of, of sports he was the first person I was aware of that had made the connection between neurotransmitter dominance and Chinese medicine. And so we hired uh, an expert in Chinese medicine to put together the ultimate Chinese herbal concoction that is found to alleviate uh, neurotransmitter depression uh, in Chinese medicine. Right. So, so we combined that with the probiotics that manufacture these Um, neurotransmitters like serotonin inside the body and put the right prebiotics with it and combined it into one formula so that people could take that. And so they would get a relative, uh, you know, within, you know, a couple of weeks would feel a a somatic effect just, just from the herbs and and from the stuff. But as, as the culture started to cultivate and develop inside the body, their capability to build the right neurotransmitters to digest their food, stay on the proper diet that's healthy for them while wiping out the bad guys uh, seems to Mm -hmm. um, produce great results. And I like it myself. I take a, uh, I take four caps every morning. You do it. Simple because yeah, I, 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 everything that we we make, I use and I use it and we do a lot of experiments with our whole team and then we test it with our university because there's a variance. There's right. all different types of diets, all different types of age groups, our companies all over the world. We're For a virtual sure. based company. Right. And this allows us to get um, an insight into the variances within things, whether it's blood sugar, whether it's overall sense of mood, whether it's digestive health. Right. And then from there, we kind of tweak the formulas to, to uh from based on what we learn and then we test them and then we offer them to the public it's so it's a very organic process that we use in in cognitive bionics um which was kind of a pioneering concept so when we first realized it, people didn't understand what it was and then now it's starting to find a cult-like following because there's a certain percentage of the population not everybody um, but there's a certain po- percentage of the population that absolutely f- feel that this makes an, an incredible difference in their life. And right. we always have a money back guarantee with everything that we do. In other words, people try it. If it's not right for them, that's okay. We'll give you your money back and try something else. And and, right. and we want to continue those experiments and de-risk them for people because we just want to help people get out of suffering and live their best healthy life. For sure. And I'm excited to have a bottle here and uh, actually just had, and you know, what really makes me interested about this, you know, uh, is the prebiotics as well added into this right so that the probiotics are going to get to where they need ideally in theory right and make survive the stomach and make it to the large intestine and i think that's a lot some research anyway showing that that is an important piece to it so i think that's really awesome and um i actually just had uh jeff shilton on the show talking about mushrooms and me writing this yeah yeah, that's on my podcast yeah right right yeah, right. So, I mean, just a wealth of knowledge and such a pioneer as well. And it was, uh, you know, chatting about lion's mane mushroom. Right now, I'm into anything that is, you know, 
uh, going to help me with mental acuity. So I'm really actually looking forward to trying this out and yeah, being part of that experiment and, and sharing my, uh, you know, my, my story with it for sure. I'm just to, just to a shout out for Jeff, um, both Matt, my business partner and I, as, as we were getting older, we found that we were starting to not have the same memory acuity. And um, I became friends with Jeff and met him at the Bulletproof Conference, him and his son. And, cool. and he was explaining the variances between mushrooms. And um, I started using his mushrooms and I took three grams a day of his lion's mane. Right unbelievable results for the memory and virtually everybody that I put on three grams a day, the big thing about that is to make sure that you, you get the, the, the type of um, mushrooms that have the right ligands, right? That that's the active component. And many of the brands have are filled with cellulase. They're not actually, you're not actually getting lignans, which is the active part, which creates the, the axionic dendritic connections inside your brain. But right. Across the board, I've seen remarkable results for people on three grams a day. Right. Uh, within a short time, you can see improvements in memory. Well, that's exactly what I did this morning. I had two of these uh, Cognibiotics empty stomach in the morning, and then a little later on in the day, I had with my uh, coffee a little later afternoon, I guess, I had uh, some some lion's mane as well. So trying to stay on point here for this uh, this very interview. But let's, uh, let's kind of get back into, I mean, we're chatting about probiotics in this specific product. And I should say that everything's going to be available at rewildmybio.com slash gut brain connection. And there is a discount code for you, the listener out there for anything at bio optimizer. So I'll be chatting about that in the uh, intro. However, let's go over, I mean, over and above, say taking probiotic supplement, what else do you suggest people do? Because we're kind of touched on, you know, that current, you know, life way essentially is, is really challenging on our gut. And we kind of painted a little bit of a, not to say doom and gloom scenario, but the reality of it is that a lot of people suffer from this and it's quite serious. So what can people do actually, you know, what do you suggest they do to heal their gut? Well, one of the things that I'm really passionate about, um, is education. And so at Bioptimizers, I actually created the awesome health system. Um, basically what I looked at is um, I tried to break down the human body into what is the one singular unit that is shared across mediums that we could agree on. And that's cells. In other words, if we can make a, the cells of your body function optimally, then that would be the foundational component um, that goes beyond dietary recommendations or things like that. It's like, okay, because all diets are designed to do the same thing, to feed, nurture the cell with, and to keep from deviances from happening. In it. And yeah. so your diet, we're dietary agnostic. That's going to be based on your genetics, your lifestyle, and your ability to kind of go there and epigenetics and your microbiome and stuff. And um, so I created a philosophy and I'll give the course away, by the way, you can download the course. Um, I created 12 weeks of videos based on these seven principles. And the seven principles are how to address a healthy lifestyle in a systemic or systematically effective way by working on the cells. And so I always say, um, okay, most people have limited time and financial resources and energy resources. So if you look at a cell, what is it? You see, food is not the primary energy source for food. It's, 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 it's oxygen. Secondary energy source is water. And the third is actually movement exercise. Uh, then we can go to a fourth one, which is sunlight. Because if you look at everything in this solar system, is just condensed light anyways. And what really is burnt at the mitochondrial levels, uh, electrons. It's called electron covalent transfer. That, that is the primary thing that creates energy in the body, whether it's from carbohydrates, from proteins, from fats, or ketones, or whatever the source happens to be. So I always say, first, you need to make sure you're hydrated properly three to four liters a day for most people. And if you're an athlete, it could be six to eight, depending on how much you're sweating. That's air. And, and air prior to that actually is deep breathing. Um, forest breathing, so many people um, are shallow breathers. Sitting at desk, we get about 30% of the oxygen that we normally do. So true. Yeah. Um, we're also in, in environmenters. And you take people out into a, a mountainous wooded area and they, and they instantly start to slow down their breaths and take deep breaths, which switch people's again from fight or flight into uh, from sympathetic to parasympathetic nervous system and they start to relax and rest and 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 these deep diaphragmic breathing can be initiated in urban type places but 
you need to kind of experience it to understand its impact. And, and oh, there's a flood of great feeling chemicals in your brain that you can actually sense and feel. Most people feel great by an ocean or, you know, by a waterfall or in the right. woods or whatever your favorite situation is, even after a lightning storm where all the ions are created. Oh, totally. um, so then we go to so air, water, and then movement. Um, exercise is so underestimated because we never had to worry about exercise as a species because life was exercise. <laughs> you right. know, the average person at the turn of the century rent walked 20 miles a day. And that was the recommendation from the uh, World Health Organization is to walk 20 miles a day. And wow. people go, 20 miles a day, that's a miracle. <laughs> I mean, we celebrate ourselves on Facebook if you can do that. Well, that was just a normal day in the life. You know, my grandfather grew up uh, on a farm and could go into town. They had a horse and a wagon. Right. And, you know, he loved to see rocket ships going into space, you know, you know, humans going into the moon, which blew his mind. They couldn't imagine that happening. For sure. So things have changed a lot in a very short period of time relative to the grand picture. So air, water, exercise, sunlight, and then optimizers. The one, things that optimize the cellular function are enzymes, probiotics. Those are the workers. Those, those build, the, build the bridges, clean the gutters, mm -hmm. deliver the mail, right? Yeah. yeah. Then, you, then you have... Essential amino acids, uh, essential fatty acids, uh, minerals, vitamins, and then I'll put herbs in a specialized category um, where they tend to activate or move or downregulate uh, the movement of chi energy in the body or the life force, that they, the energy behind things. Mm -hmm. And then the last two things. Uh, mental beliefs and attitudes as you get your MBA and then et cetera, testing and coaching. So that creates the awesome acronym. You can have a pretty good life. If you have a great attitude and you can have a pretty bad life, if you're doing everything right. Uh, you won't be healthy. And then finally, how do you learn this? Well, the, the root word of education is to educe, to learn from within and to learn from within, you have to run a test. Whether that's I can walk up the stairs. How do I feel? Whether it's using the latest biohacking equipment, testing, allows you to, to figure out what's working for you. And the fastest way to, to, you know, hack all of that is to get a coach to help you guide you through the process. So number one, you accept, Hey, I'm not producing the result I want. Right. That's number two. That's a result of the current habits that I have in my lifestyle. And three, how do I integrate systematically the habits that are going to allow me to do what I want? Well, that's where a coach comes in because it, there's so much confusing information that's taken out of context on the internet that people don't have, that they, they can't see the forest through the trees. Well said, and yeah. so having that person that can guide you through it, that's done the test and coach the people will really streamline the process and, and allow you to get there faster. And so I give away that course. Um, so when you go to the site or whatever, you can get the course and, you can kind of look into all my different aspects and it's basically the condensation of 30 years in the industry in simple seven, five to 15 minute videos where people can just get the snippet while they're in line at the grocery store or at the, you know, at the recital for the kids right. and, uh, and, and, and put together a framework so that they know how to actually choose what's most important to them first. So we don't even talk about supplements to the fifth piece of the pie um, because there's all these other areas they can do first. That's awesome. It's, um, you know, it sounds like a, a program I can get behind for sure. I might have to come out to California and we can do any, any one of the things that you do in each one of those categories there. Yeah. Cause that's just well, it. I mean, it sounds like to me, you've got all the, the building blocks of life, right? You've got all the elements there. You've got the sun. So the fire, you've got the air, the breathing, right? Water, obviously being important, the food and just everything. Right. And, and yeah, it's something I can get down or behind for sure. So I'll make sure I list that in the show notes, but that's actually kind of a, a nice little segue to ask you a, a personal question as we kind of get on the hour mark here. Um, just curious, like what we, that right there, you, you did touch on again, a lot of the kind of elemental medicine as I, as I like to call it, what exactly do you like to do to kind of tap into your wild side or how do you commune with nature for good health? Is there any, like, you, I, I know you use the word biohack. I sometimes use the word word wild hack. So things that mimic the health benefits of nature say so something like an infrared sauna i like to use if i maybe haven't you know gone and have a, an actual fire in a long time or things like that what are what are you what are things you like to do actually in nature and then maybe is there any gadgets that you use out there to kind of mimic okay, nature yeah. glad you glad you asked great question so 
First and foremost, I have a meditation deep breathing process. So what I forgot to mention is when I was 15, pushed into the woods forcibly, mm. I got to know what quietness actually was. And I, I think that was a great advantage later in life. I didn't understand at the time, but I know what it's like to walk in the forest, to feel quiet in my mind and in my body. And so that was a big advantage. And so as I lived more in urban cities, I realized I needed to get back to that and got into a meditation, deep breathing practice. So that's the first thing. Second, um, I hydrate daily. Um, I use an, an ionized water machine um, because I want to introduce as much electrons into the system. So ionizers are a great way to create unlimited antioxidants to deal with free radical damage. And I, I've been using one of those for the last 14 years. Yeah, super important in cities too, without a doubt. Just, huge, you know, huge. EMF I mean, pollution and things like that. Exactly. Yeah. And um, then for exercise, I do exercise every day. I have a mini trampoline on the roof of my house. I have a rooftop training facility. I was going to say I that built. sounded dangerous at first. I was picturing like a, a trampoline on a slanted roof. Or yeah, something. Here, here at the bio home, as I call it here in cool. the middle of Venice, I have um, on the fourth floor, I have this, um, it's, a, it's a huge area. I got a gym and I got a rebounder and places to sit out in the sunshine and enjoy nature. And, and I'm overlooking Venice and the palm trees are around and I train out there in the sun and it's amazing. Mm -hmm. So it's really organic and, and nice. And I love that piece about it, training in the fresh air and uh, in the sunshine and, and getting the sun into the body mm. to activate my mitochondrial function and boost up my vitamin D levels to keep my immunity up. Um, and the rebounder particularly is interesting. I'll come back to that in a second because there's a little 10 minute hack that I, that I use for many people that they love. Then I also take time, uh, my first meal, you know, it'll have enzymes, it'll have probiotics, it has vitamins, it has minerals, it has essential fatty acids, it has all the amino acids I require. It has um, uh, usually fruit and, and, and mixed all together in a blender shake where I can really stimulate and nutrify my body uh, in a great way. And then I try to spend a little bit of time implementing something from that, that gets me pumped up uh, from a mental belief attitude program and that could be that could be if i'm feeling a little down mm -hmm. i'll just put on some great music that gets me up while i'm jumping on my rebounder and uh, or i'll be listening to something inspirational maybe some psychological stuff from you know jordan peterson or something like that or right. tony robbins or whoever it happens to be or my favorite athlete yeah. um and then um i'll usually be doing some kind of test like last week i was Last week, I was testing the, my endocannabinoid system, and I was testing my body for yeah. deuterium levels. Right. <laughs> and, you know, the week before that, we were doing a, a Dutch hormone test to see how uh, I'm, you know, how I'm doing on my hormone profile, and right. and then maybe a glucose blood sugar monitor because we were testing our, our our new blood sugar product to how it regulates and how food regulates and then the difference between if i take the blood sugar product versus if i don't right. so i can actually see in real time these things um i'll do cryotherapy at bulletproof labs oh yeah uh, you know probably four or five times a week um as another hack i work out with weights yep uh, you know, five times a week, mm -hmm. uh, which I, which I love. I, I don't know why I love lifting heavy inanimate objects in multiple different directions. It's silly, but <laughs> yeah. Right. But will you ever get out to, uh, I say, no, it's not silly. It sounds again, just like, uh, you know, talking about pumping iron in that uh, you, you get out onto Venice beach to work out down there. How, how does that, uh, well, yeah, I, I usually later in the afternoons, um, like right after this, um, I'll take a walk down to Gold's and t what I do is I, I, I'm a, just down the street from the beach. Right. So I literally, the wind, I live on this part where the wind blows right up from the beach nice. onto my top roof and I walk down there and I'll put my feet right on the sand, walk around on the sand, either on my way to Bulletproof or to Gold's Gym to do a workout on either nice. there or on the way back. And it's, it's a nice way to ground mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, I like to I, I like to unplug from the digital world and go out there and just it's so interesting because it's so chaotic here in Venice. Mm -hmm. And then you walk past the chaos of the kind of the boardwalk and then past the, the, the homeless people and the skaters and, you know, the drug dealers and all that sort of stuff. Right. And then you get out, you know, a few hundred feet out into the sand and then it's just ocean and sand and, mm -hmm. and, and you're like 
you're kind of out of the electromagnetic field and you can feel the difference. You, sure. you feel yourself out of it and you're like, wow. And then you go back into it. So it feels like, you know, Morpheus flying his ship in and out of the matrix. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. But um, for people who are pressed for time, that's what I suggest. I have a 10 minute routine. It's on the awesome formula. Was okay. where you get up in the morning. I take a, a liter of, of, of the ionized water. I've dropped my vitamins and mineral drops in it and guzzle that down, go upstairs, get on my mini trampoline. And I start deep breathing while I'm bouncing right. and doing some positive uplifting music uh, or like that self uh, affirmations, things like that. You know, 6 a.m. I'm jumping up there telling the world how great I am or where the day is going to go. So yeah. But it's Venice. Nobody notices, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, and, you know, feel myself energized. And then I come down and I, I have that whole smoothie set up and with, with every nutrient, every vitamin. So I start the day feeding every cell of my body with the entire awesome formula. If you do that and have, say, a salad and whatever uh, protein or fats that you like, good for you. Mm. you got you got most of the day beat okay you have something that's not right in the in the in the evening it's not a big deal because you did all enough good things and i believe if you just continue to add good things to your life mm. the bad things will eventually fall away on their own right you don't have enough time to do them that way if you're doing all the good things right, right. no that's great i like how you get at it in the morning and you, and you kind of take care of that early like you say because then yeah the rest of the day is yours right to to do as you please and yeah i mean just to just to have that beach there and that to be able to like you say unplug from the matrix with a little bit of earthing there and feet in the sand that's uh it sounds like some pretty good nature medicine to me for sure well my last question for you there wade is question i ask all guests and it can be different for you today tomorrow um basically you can we, we can kind of reflect on what we chatted about or, or not um but kind of looking out towards our mother the earth what would you say your wildest dream is for the earth be for humanity, for the earth, wherever you're feeling. That's a great question. You know, when I was 18, I took a job with Broland Enterprises, I think it was called, to plant trees in northern Ontario. Yeah. And when you plant 2,000 trees on a day, and so I planted about 40,000 trees, but, you know, had a couple of good days and it was a very rough, probably the worst experience of my life, but it was very tough. The, the, black fly, the black flies get you? Yeah, yeah. We had to tape our neck and our faces and everything and like oh, take man. t-shirts over. Like it was bad. Yeah. It's, it's not comprehensible how intense it is, but I got a shirt and for planting 2,000 trees. And, and I remember the back of that t-shirt it said, a man does not understand the meaning of life until he's planted a tree under which shade he shall never sit. Mm. And so I think there's so many people out there that's virtue signaling. They want to get behind these kind of loosely held causes, which if you do a deep dive, aren't necessarily com contributing what they're doing. And they're looking to allocate their time and energy resources in a way that looks good, but may not be good. Right. And what happens is I would encourage that people can take their own impetus. You know what? As a young person, go plant trees for a summer. It sucks, but you'll learn something. You'll be out in nature and then you'll also discover something about there's, there's some tough parts about it but you also develop so many characteristics. I, I knew once I, I did that job, I could do anything. Um, I also know that I changed my carbon imprint and you can plant flowers. You can go out in nature, but the more that you connect yourself to nature, one of my friends of mine, he's a, he's a genius physicist and he used to plant trees every year for 20 years. And he said all of his best ideas came when his hands were deep in the soil. Wow. So plant something. I think for humans, whether that's a little tomato plant on your balcony, whether it's growing a garden or whether it's planting a tree somewhere else, cultivate something in the, in that world and grow it. And it'll change your perception of what we're here to do. Forget the grandstanding, forget the virtue signaling, forgetting the big charity organization, go out and experience it yourself because 
Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. And once you've done that, you get it. And that's all you need to do is once everybody gets it, then the changes that we all hope to happen will not be caused by protests. It will not be caused by government regulations. It will not be caused by special interest groups and charity organizations. It will be caused because the natural awareness of everybody on the planet will go, well, of course. And that's all that we need to do. That's awesome. It really is. I, I got to second that because, yeah, just getting your hands dirty, right? That's how we're going to create change for the future. It's not from a, how pretty your sign is or or how, you know, who you, who you vote for next. We really got to do plant that garden, get your hands dirty, deal with the black flies, deal with some hormesis and some some hard some hard times, right? And I hear you. Right yeah. on. Right on. Well, you know, th- thanks so much, Wade, for being here. I really do appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Um, just share quickly maybe where other – I mean, we're going to link everything in the show notes again. It's going to be at rewildmybio.com slash gutbrainconnection. Um, but, yeah, tell folks maybe how they can, you know, stay in tune with bio-optimizers and everything going on there. Yeah, they just go to uh, bioptimizers.com and, uh, you know, or we got Instagram and Facebook and all my team makes me do videos and make little tidbits and we have the awesome health podcast that's available there and I would just encourage everybody to um, go get the course. You know, I put my heart and soul into that because there was so much confusion out there with my clients around the world, you know, and I think there's, you know, whether it's me or some other expert that's talking about various things, we're always giving generalizations and to kind of encourage people to take that. But if they take that next step and get into it, my goal was not to tell people what to do, but it's to arm them with the understanding and comprehension and ability to discern between the wheat from the chafe and be able to make better decisions in their life relative to the economic capacity that they have. And once you get that, it becomes, it builds its own momentum and you tend to efficiently use your resources. So yeah, it's been a pleasure to be here. And I I love spreading this mission because I, I, my biggest mission in life is to end physical suffering and activate biologically optimized health. That's awesome. I share in your passion and I, and I thank you for all your work doing that. You truly are a pioneer and thank you for, you know, spending this time here again with us here on the show. And thanks everybody out there for listening to this one. If you liked it, please share it with a friend. You can leave the rating and review because that will help people find all the good things Wade's doing. And uh, yeah, we'll have everything again over in the show notes, rewildmybio.com slash gut brain connection. Stay wild. For listening to the Rewild My Bio podcast. Please subscribe to the show and leave a five star rating if you have enjoyed this episode. I have so much gratitude for all of you who continue to share this show with your friends. It really does mean so much to me. If you want more content from Rewild My Bio, then please check out rewildmybio.com to find previous episodes and sign up for the newsletter. In the newsletter, I share blogs I have written and reflections from my current health promotion research. Please follow along on Instagram and Telegram with the handle at rewildmybio and on Twitter, at Sean Slade. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, stay wild.